So I guess it's just sort of a question for the audience, maybe a show of hands. Um, did Biden win? Show of hands, yes? Well, maybe. But did he win? <laughs> I like Tom's take. Did Biden win? I, I, don't, I don't know. I honestly don't. Because I, once, I did an episode of my podcast on this, and it was about 1 o'clock in the morning when we recorded it, because I have to have it in the Dropbox for my audio guy by the crack of dawn. I cannot record the same day that it comes out. So I thought, i got to do an episode where I have the most recent information before I go to bed. And I, and I was so tired, and I had to get up early for the kids and everything. And, and, I, and we thought Trump had won, because all the remaining states... Were, were pink, which meant they were trending Trump. So we all thought, and then the next morning, everything had been thrown into, into doubt. And I just thought, I sacrificed to make that episode and this SOB is going to claim, <laughs> you know, it's going to turn around. So I was so frustrated and tired that I just couldn't even bring myself to read the articles about it. So I'm still completely in the dark. For all I know, it's totally on the up and up. And for all I know, there were all kinds of shenanigans. But and I even have people I trust saying, look, you got to just admit it. He did lose, and it was fair and square, and there were some areas of the state that weren't counted. And, pff, I don't know. I'm not able to adjudicate it. Yeah, it's interesting, though. There's, I don't know if you've heard this phrase, the uh, margin of fraud. In other words, every election with 330 million people is going to have all kinds of fraudulent votes across states. So you have to win enough, whether that's 52 yeah, or 51 right. or whatever, to overcome that, and that's, that's probably true. Daniel, do you think uh, um, from a foreign policy perspective, Biden is Obama and W, or what is he? No, Biden is more hawkish than Obama. Um, uh, if you want to go down the list, we can talk about what a Biden foreign policy would look like. You'll see the, the most hawkish members of the Obama uh, administration's foreign policy <clears throat> coming out of the woodwork, people like uh, uh, Susan Rice, uh, uh, and uh, people like Michelle Florna, who may well be the next Secretary of Defense, if the, if the cheating is successful. Uh, you'll see, uh, some people have said, well, and in, in, in Dr. Paul and I would have admitted this, uh, the one success of the Obama foreign policy, of course, was the Iran deal, um, and certainly the turnaround on Cuba policy. Uh, I don't have any expectation uh, that uh, a President Biden would go back to the deal. He can't. Uh, he can't do that at this point. What he might try to do is negotiate, renegotiate the deal, and the Iranians are not having it. They sat down fair and square. They inked a deal. The deal went through. The deal was working just fine. And then Obama <clears throat> came in like a bull in a china shop and overturned it for his constituency. But Biden is no less uh, beholden in any stretch of the imagination to special interests in the Middle East than President Trump is. He's just slightly more subtle about <laughs> how he does it. So a, a Biden foreign policy will go back to confrontation with Russia in Syria. <clears throat> there is no question a Biden foreign policy will halt the withdrawal of U.S. troops from Afghanistan, uh, and et cetera, et cetera. Even as Trump, the, the actions don't necessarily match the words 100 uh, percent. The, the, certainly the, uh, the <clears throat> The, the instinct is there, uh, the, uh, the uh, articulation of a policy is there. No, Biden will definitely be a more hawkish president. Uh, and at this point, confronting China and Russia uh, in, 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 in places like the Middle East and the Far East, uh, I think have much more danger of, of starting a war. And let's not forget, guess who was chair of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee for the Iraq war vote? fighting Joe Biden. Uh, Hunter was not involved in that war, to my knowledge. He was otherwise engaged. Um, and we know that Kamala Harris, the great humanitarian, will act as a check on his worst impulses, maybe. But uh, here's my prediction for the in early stages of a Biden presidency, is there's going to be uh, sort of a new reconstruction. In other words, uh, an effort to exact retribution on the red states in various forms. Now, Trump did this a little bit. One thing Trump did against the blue states was he took away or actually limited 
the amount of state income taxes you could deduct as an itemized deduction on your federal income taxes. And of course, if you look at your federal marginal tax rate for your income up here, people in California would say, well, you know, my rate is really high, but I'm able to deduct, or excuse me, people in California uh, would say, you know, our income tax rate's really high, but I'm able to deduct that on my federal income tax return, so my actual effective tax rate is lower than it appears, and I can sort of live with that. So Trump came along and said, you know, okay, here's your comeuppance. We're going to take that away from you. And that hurt a lot of really wealthy and high-income people in California, and a lot of them moved to places like in Incline Village, Nevada, you know, as a result to be nearby. So I think that the Dems, for all their talk about equality and egalitarianism on taxes, they'll undo that quickly. They'll un watch, watch for that, folks, in the early months and the House Ways and Means Committee, because all their big blue state donors are gonna want that state income tax deduction resuscitated. But I suspect there will be all kinds of little ways in which uh, Biden administration will attempt to stick it to the red states. Because remember, it's not just that they had the audacity four years ago to install this orange man as president. It, it was worse than that. In the progressive worldview, it was worse than they just voted for a terrible guy. They, they did something worse. They denied Hillary Clinton and this country, you know, the next, the next level in its inevitable arc of history. Because if you're a progressive, and let me tell you something, there are right-wing conservative progressives and there are libertarian progressives. Okay, if you're a progressive, you believe that there's an arc to history rather than something we all have to get up every day and produce and earn. Um, and so I think, I think you are going to see a new reconstruction. And if, it is, uh, uh, if it's somewhat open, then maybe that's the catalyst the red states will need to be thinking more in terms of making their own interstate compacts. And if Trump had managed to win this election, or if somehow he prevails in the Supreme Court, uh, you are absolutely going to see the blue states, people like Gavin Newsom in California, he's referred to his own state as a, as a nation state. He's going to enter into interstate compacts with Oregon and Washington and Nevada, maybe, and say, you know, we're, here's our position on, you know, certain Trump edicts, and we're not going to follow them, that sort of thing. So that's, that, I think that would have been fascinating if Trump had simply won outright, including the popular vote. That would have forced progressives to say, oh, you know, this is not the country we thought it was, and we don't want to be part of this racist, retrograde, uh, reactionary, fascist America anymore. Uh, but now that they've won, <laughs> or apparently won, all of a sudden it's going to be like, well, you know, uh, we have a mandate. So I, I think it's, it's probably bad for, uh, I think a Biden presidency, apart from the obvious things, I think from a strategic perspective is probably not good. Can I say something about the virus? Because that's a little bit on my mind and how Biden would handle that. Because, you know, the, I think opinion is divided among our folks as to whether if Biden were to win would we suddenly see that the virus doesn't matter anymore all of a sudden? Or would he, would he clamp down even harder? And you can make a pretty good case for either one. You could actually make a case for both, that he clamps down hard for a little while, then after that pretends that that's what brought it down and then declares victory. I mean, obviously, if by the, the midterm elections we're still social distancing and all that, then how can he honestly claim I was following the science? The science must suck. If, if, if you did all this and we had all these sacrifices and we're still doing, I mean, it's, uh, some normal people have to catch on at that point. So there are ways that he could, I mean, I wonder if deep down he's, you know, he's not that bright of a guy, but is he smart enough to recognize what's really happening with the virus? And is he smart enough to know what's going on, the problems with the PCR testing? As they're starting to substitute these rapid tests that are not as sensitive but that they are starting to roll out, the case numbers will fall. And Biden could use that and say, look at this. You know, I mean, the, 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 the virus is already, we're already making this tremendous progress. It's no difference, it's no progress. It's just that they're, they're more accurately measuring what's really happening. So there are ways that he could bring the number down or uh, there are ways you can emphasize certain aspects of data to make it look not so terrible. So if he wants to do it that way, there are definitely ways he could make it look like 
I came in, we did a couple of quick, tough things, we followed the science, and now look. Yeah, if I can just comment on that. Although, as Pink Floyd said, the worms have eaten into the brain uh, of Joe Biden. Uh, it's true, he know, he's not dumb enough to not understand that a lockdown will destroy the economy. The, the economy that we all know is built on a house of sand, and it's just a miracle that it didn't crash under Trump. So Biden understands that if he locks down the economy, he's going to preside over a massive economic collapse. That, that would be my argument for him doing some early symbolic measures, declaring victory, and backing off. But Tom, when you said nobody wants any good news on COVID, you've yeah, never but, seen anything but, like, was, but, that, was that all just get Trump by having a drumbeat of bad news? I, I, some of it, but on the other hand, all through Europe, some of them don't want to hear good news either. It's, it's just crazy. I mean, I remember when I first followed this, I was very, very worried about the virus. My first couple of emails about it, I was very worried about it. So like a normal person, I was scouring the internet to see, is there a silver lining? Not silver lining, but is there any good news? Is there anything indicating that it won't be as bad as they say? Like a normal person, I was looking for that to see if it was there. And it's like these people aren't even looking for that. So, so some of it has to do with Trump. But on the other hand, it's like I think some of these people are going to be so relieved to be, have Trump you know, be out of there. And they are so convinced that Trump was just not following what science says, even though he absolutely was after he stopped paying attention to Fauci, uh, that I think they might be willing to hear it from a Joe Biden. And they might be willing even to hear it from a Fauci if he can bring himself to say it. Well, there certainly hasn't been an election in my lifetime anywhere, anyway where the vice president was considered a successor uh, you know, with this kind of intensity, and, and depending on Biden's health, I mean, we don't know. So when we categorize politicians from our perspective, you know, it's really about personality. It's not about ideology or policy. We know, we all know that. But so when you look at them, you can say there's sort of categories. You could take, and I don't know if this is true, but the stereotype, you take W and you could say, well, he's dumb, but nice, okay? And then you could take a Bill Clinton and say he's smart, but nice. And you can live with that. Okay, you don't need, because you're not a true believer type. And then you could take someone like Hillary Clinton and say she's smart but mean. Okay, and so you start to go down. And then you get to Kamala and you have she's dumb and mean. <laughs> so, I mean, so, so you get, you know, you get to a point where do you want smart, you know, earnest, true believer, wonkish, uh, politicians with this kind of just unbelievable power, or do we want them dumb? But the thing is, if they're dumb, then they get manipulated by people in the shadows, like George W. Bush. Yeah, I, don't, I don't think Trump is dumb. I, I, I don't, obviously, he's incurious. He's not red, which is fine in, in some ways. But I do think he is immensely susceptible to flattery. And as a result of that, it was easy for people to surround him. You know, why, why is Trump, after all of his 2016 rhetoric, why is John Bolton even within, he, he, there should have been an airstrike on John Bolton, <laughs> right? I mean, why is, why is John Bolton within 100 miles of the White House? Yeah. Why, why is Bill Crystal, you know, uh, so, so that's the thing, is, 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 is personnel policy. Yeah, I think the one, <clears throat> the one good thing about Trump from a libertarian perspective uh, which unfortunately translated to very bad policy, is that he appears to be completely uninterested in governing. He is uninterested in the process. He's uninterested in, in actually wielding power and making it happen. Uh, case in point, I want all of the Russia stuff declassified, but he didn't actually write an official order ordering it to be declassified as he had the authority to do as President of the United States. Um, he allowed the people that he hired to correct him and clarify him. I want everyone out of Afghanistan. Well, what the president meant to say is there's a process with several benchmarks. And <laughs> so he's not interested in wielding power, actually wielding power. He's interested in the appearance of wielding power. Uh, that would be a good thing in a perfect world. Unfortunately, we're not, we're not in that place now. You know, this is something I struggle with because we've always sort of preached that you should live a non-political life and that politics was not the, the, <clears throat> the ends or the means. We ought to be educating people, winning hearts and minds. And it feels to me like something's changed uh, in just the last five or 10 years where the whole world has gotten so politicized that if you're not engaged, you almost feel like um, you're being, uh, you know, you're making yourself susceptible to being imposed upon. Should we be political? 
you start, and then I'll, I'll riff on what you say. <laughs> well, I have, a, I mean, I guess I'm going to make a confession in a way, because we've always been actively apolitical and anti-political, and Jeff's philosophical reasons for being that way that he's articulated over the last several years at least are very, very important, which is that our obligation as libertarians is to make a living, have a family if that's what we choose to do, and live a normal life and have the state be completely away from us as possible, ignore it as much as possible, homeschool uh, as much as possible. But I have to confess, over watching what's happened over the last couple of days, I had started thinking, good grief, I mean, this might be a, a time where we have to find people uh, for the midterm elections, and, and, I mean, really, I, I shouldn't say this in public because it goes against all of my instincts. All right, I'm glad you said it. <laughs> because, I, yeah, I, I would love to say, oh, I, I could just ignore politics and so on, and to some degree that is, you, you always can, right? You can always live your life to whatever, but w after what we've seen them capable of doing in 2020, and that the masses went along with so much of it. And because the mass, where are the masses getting their information? From politicians, by and large. Yeah, they're getting it from scientists, but scientists chosen by politicians. That's where the masses are getting their information. So to say, well, we're, we're just above politics. Okay, then I think you're just ceding the ground then to people who have extremely sinister intentions, have shown they can manipulate the public into cheering their own destruction. The, their livelihoods are ruined and they don't even dare speak up about it because if they say, oh my gosh, I'm, I've suffered this terrible tragedy, they'll be told they're selfish, evil bastards. And they've gone along with this instead of, instead of righteously resisting. So I feel like if we were to retreat from the, the political arena at a time like this, I, I don't see how that is going to make me live freer. And, and I, I have been wanting to say I'm sick of politics, I'm not part of it, but after what they've done here, I just I can't let the SOBs get away with it. So, sorry for the vulgarity, I'm sorry. That reminds me of an old joke in the Soviet Union. One says to the other, I love the party, and the other says, yes, but does the party love you? Mm. And we say we hate politics, yes, but do politics hate you? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, and part of it, I, I would say in my own evolution, and this has not been comfortable for me, we all hate to have our worldview or our framework challenged. It's, even 10 years ago, I probably would have been one of those obnoxious uh, people saying, oh, you know, just, it's all about the state. And, you know, it, uh, a, a traffic cop in a bad mood or a DMV clerk that you have to deal with to get your stupid tag they have more power over you than Facebook or Google or CNN. You know, it, it, you can, you, your relationship with Google and Facebook and CNN is voluntary, but you have to deal with that traffic cop or that DMV clerk, you know. And I, I've really had to change on that. And, and I think Michael Rechtenwald is going to speak about that this afternoon. But the, the, the nexus, the confluence, the, the intertwining of state and corporation now is just so incredibly deep. That, that, that just kind of neat formulation doesn't work anymore. Uh, by the way, let me add how happy I am that Michael Rechtenwald is part of this event. If you don't know him yet, he's a former professor at NYU, an ex-Marxist, spent much of his life as a Marxist, um, an ex-Marxist now, and those are the best kind because he knows, every, he knows the names, he knows who did what. Um, but last night we had a nice event at Dr. Paul's house and Michael was there and and we ate dinner, and, and, and finally I had time to go find him. He was already gone. So I, I wonder, how X of a Marxist is he? He shows up, eats the free food, then he's gone. I, I but it, it's, you know, when you look at things strategically at the state and local level, there's, for example, in your town, there are probably nonpartisan races. And I think those are the best kind, because once, you know, this R&D thing is just absolute poison. And once you get into that uh, binary, you know, in your town, let's say, I, I live in a college town of about 70,000 people, 75,000, Auburn, Alabama. And, and to, so fortunately, we have a nonpartisan city council. Um, my wife has is is sort of asked me to run for that because it's, 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 it's geographical, it's by area. And I said, you know, anyone who takes, is going to find a YouTube of me in two minutes, and that's going to be out the window. 
Okay, so that's, that's, that's a non-starter. But what we need is to find nonpartisan races because if your neighbors are Ds and you run for something as an R, you've automatically created a wedge, which is just so horrible. It's so horrible to think of. And, but, but if you can find those nonpartisan races, what we need to find is younger people. You know, we need to find younger people to be running, stuff, running for stuff who see the world the way we do, because, you know, um, I think that's really the key, is getting people 30 and under to run, because they have an automatic, I think, cachet and a freshness. Um, and, and, you know, that's, that's strategic thinking. You know, it's not like the guy who has the best idea, some middle-aged white guy. Well, okay, that, you know, but we, we need to be thinking strategically. Jeff, I went to a city council meeting this past week, the first time I've ever done it. You would not like it. <laughs> They spend about 20 minutes talking about the kind of trash truck they needed to buy. Well, it's, it's right after the proctologist and the root canal. Yeah. But, um, you, you know, the question, though, and I think we're, we, I, I know people in this room feel this, is politics is interested in you. And, and that's just the reality. So as much as we talk about uh, federalism, subsidiarity, outright secession, uh, nullification, uh, these things are not uh, neat and easy, and there's no reason that, that, that we should expect them to be. You know, that's, that's human history, but we don't have neat geographic lines. There are deep red and blue within virtually every state, and that's, you know, red and blue is, is just sort of one line you could draw. So, um, just a couple minutes left. Uh, you know, give, give us the case for optimism, assuming uh, Biden's president, and we go forward from here. Two minutes. <laughs> okay. Well, I, I, I'm, I was actually glad, Daniel, to hear you come up with a scenario by which Biden steps back from... Because obviously in the long run, in the short run, you can get people on your side with the social distancing and all the impositions on them. But I don't think, I mean, even the most cynical among us can't possibly think that's a long-run strategy. He's got to step back from it. And I was even wondering if, if Trump stayed in, there could be a way in which it would take even longer to get out of this because all the politicized scientists would still be pretending it was a fiasco. There was a, there was a report the other day about how we've had more cases in, the, in, the, in one day than ever before. And as I showed you, the case thing doesn't even matter. And Kulldorff at Harvard says it doesn't even matter. Don't even worry about it. But the, the woman used the word, it's the highest toll of the whole... Th There's no one dead. What are you talking about? Cases... Do what? It's, it's somebody who has a sniffles or nothing. Might have nothing. And this is the highest toll. Like they're even using language like toll. They're not going to use the language like toll under Joe Biden. So there are some dynamics that I think, oddly enough, might make it more likely that we more rapidly emerge from this under Joe Biden. And by the way, the guilt is overwhelming me. Um, that killer joke I told about Recton Wall, that was Jenna's joke, and I just feel bad that I got the credit for that. Okay, all right, go ahead. Well, I guess as long as we're doing true confessions, at least I'm doing true confessions, I have to admit, I'm a 14-year I'm a, a proud non-voter. Uh, the last person I voted for... Uh, was Jim Webb for the Senate, who Jeff and I both admire in many ways. Um, but I had a tinge. I had a weird tinge. You know, gosh, I probably should have voted. And it's not because I love Trump. I don't. And we have huge problems with him. It's because we're terrified of Biden. Uh, we're terrified of the... We, we know that Trump is, is goofy and he doesn't do the right things and he does a lot of terrible things. He's not a libertarian. But we have no idea what Biden is going to do or say or even wake up thinking he is who he is tomorrow. So it's, it's terrifying, and I had that tinge. But I want to I wanna do a... Because a, 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 I get this thing, I get obsessed. And I have been obsessed with this process of what's happening the last couple of days, not sleeping and not eating, trying to figure out what's happening. And if I can just have one minute, I want to say red flag and smoking gun, because I think although... Because of the preponderance of the, the core, as the Soviets would say, uh, the correlation of forces is definitely in favor of Biden. There are some red flags and smoking guns out there. One of the most brilliant attorneys, in my opinion, in the United States now is Sidney Powell. And she represented Mike Flynn and was able to get him out. Uh, she gave a, she, she was on Lou Dobbs yesterday or today. And she made some excellent points about uh, the hammer and score po scorecard programs. I don't want to get too far into the woods here. But in Michigan's Antrim County, 
a glitch using one of those programs switched a Biden victory to a Trump victory plus 2,500 votes. There are 47 more counties in Michigan that have used that program that seems to be prone to one-way glitches, and there are several other swing states that use that program that, use, that, that comes up with these glitches. So I would say uh, that may be the red flag that they're looking for. Of course, my friend sent that to me this, uh, this morning, and I said, but if a tree falls in the woods, does anyone hear it? We don't have a correlation of forces for us, uh, those of us who don't want to see a steal happen, practically zero. So, but that and the amazing disconnect between the people who voted for Trump and voted for a Republican senator and the people who voted for Biden and a Democratic senator, the margins in swing states are unbelievable and unprecedented. There were hundreds of thousands of ballots turned in with just Biden marked and no one else marked, which is pretty anomalous when it comes to voting. So there are a few things out there, maybe we're grasping at straws. And again, I'm not a, a, a Trump cheerleader by any stretch, but what's happening I think will hurt us more than uh, four years of the orange buffoon. Well, we'll leave it at that. Lou Rockwell says, Trump doesn't deserve to be reelected. Re we don't deserve Joe Biden. So we'll be back in half an hour, folks. Thanks.